Uh, new technologies have given way to unforeseen societal changes affecting the way we communicate, connect, and spend time in our day-to-day -day lives. This panel will take a look at the newest influential technologies while discuss discussing the ethics of generative AI, virtual beings, and metaverses. We are going to have, meta, as our moderator and uh, founder from Post Reality Labs, Jesse Damiani, along with Deputy Director of the New York Public Library Branch Programs and Services, Dr. Brandy McNeil, Founding General Partner of Endemic Venture Capital, Marina Shihei, Lead Researcher of Tales of Us, Kenneth Norwood, Director of the, of the Responsible Technology Team at Amadar, Thea Anderson, plus a very special guest. So welcome to the stage panel. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you to Games for Change. Thrilled to be here on the 20th anniversary of a really wonderful organization. Um, today, we have a really uh, great panel for you called Brave New World or Better New World, which is um, a sort of a fun way of kind of getting at some ethics and first principles um, when we're looking at these uh, emerging technologies that sort of manifest as buzzwords and takes and all these different sort of competing Ooh. opinions. Um, and so we have four really esteemed humans and, and one uh, <laughs> much, much discussed uh, large language model um, who are gonna be kind of weighing in on, on these issues. Um, my name is Jesse Damiani. I'm a writer and a curator, um, arts and culture advisor of an organization called Protocol Labs, which if you've seen Silicon Valley, the whole build a better internet thing is kind of based on Protocol Labs. So that's kind of more or less what Protocol Labs does. Um, and I also work as a curator at Next Museum, which is a new media museum in Amsterdam. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to give a little bit of introduction to who you are and a little bit of, about how your work intersects with, with these topics. And uh, Rico, I'll Me start. first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, my name is Rico, Kenneth Norwood as well too. I am a PhD um, recipient of the University of Southampton. I'm the lead researcher for Tales, a nonprofit storytelling initiative that is international. We are currently building a video game interactive experience for eight year olds and plus that centers ecology through mythology. So we work in places like Brazil, Congo, Romania, and India is our new locality. And um, I do a lot of stuff in terms of like reading in our database through notions of like just going through paperwork. AI has kind of integrated in the back end in that way, but we also put together recently a library of myths, which takes over 200 tales from like around the world. And AI definitely helped us in terms of like extrapolating some of these themes, deities and things like that as well, but also humans were helping us as well too. So we used it as a tool to help us like sift through like all this stuff. That's how AI helps me in my job, pass. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Sagitamu. My name is Marina Shihei. Uh, my family comes from the Pueblo of San Aldefonso and I'm married into the Pueblo of Zia in Northern New Mexico. Um, I've been in tech for about 20 years in all sorts of capacities. Right now, I serve as a general partner to Endemic Venture Capital, which is a venture studio building indigenous-led climate tech and tribal gaming future products. Um, I also serve as a special advisor to President Von Sharp with the World Economic Forum, looking at the future for indigenous peoples, as well as um, lots of work with the UN and tech policy. You know, what happens when AI goes rogue? What do we do with killer drones? It's, it's humanity. <laughs> um, and looking at that, uh, that also under what, what happens through um, our tri sovereign tribal nations. So thank you and on to next. Okay, I'm Dr. Brandy McNeil. I am the deputy director for the New York Public Library. Um, I've also been on the Public Library Association's board. I just got done doing that. Um, I'm also a writer and the way in which libraries show up in this space is through lifelong learning. That has been a mission of most libraries across the US. And so we do that in a variety of different ways. So when I think of what we do at the New York Public Library, we have programs such as Project Code. Project Code has been able to partner with large giants such as Google and Microsoft and uh, MIT. And so we have been able to create 
ways in which we can ensure that marginalized communities are not left behind in this tech space. We do things like tech talks, where we bring in people who are creating NFTs that look like the people that come into our libraries. We also have partnered with Apple to create app development programs. And we just recently had a hackathon. And that hackathon was about really helping um, people who have disabilities. And so people were creating apps that would help people with disabilities. So that's some of the work we do. Hi, I'm Thea Anderson. I'm on the responsibility, uh, responsible technology team at Omidyar Network. Omidyar Network is a social responsibility firm uh, funded by Pierre Omidyar, who is the original founder of eBay. We do grant making and investments. I have primarily focus on ethics in technology, though it evolves and it changes depending on the different issues in the technology sector. Um, but it always, underlying always ends up focusing a lot on ethics in the space. Um, and right now quite a bit uh, is focused on a concentration of power in the technology space. AI has always been an issue, but it seems to be evolving <laughs> much more as, as the interests grow quite a bit as well. Um, other issues focusing quite a bit now is around issues around disinformation online, especially around content moder moder uh, moderation. Um, especially growing in the gaming space. We hadn't really been working in that space, um, but I've been pushing it very, very hard, and now we're, we're starting to move more in that space. I think more there's a recognition um, that's been so wonderful to hear over the last couple of days is just that tech obviously is being tested on the gaming infrastructure, but that this is where culture is also being tested to some extent. So mm. it's been really empowering <laughs> to hear this over the last couple of days. Mm. Thank you all. Um, just a kind of um, uh, housekeeping note. Um, I, the, the, some of these questions are gonna be a little bit more scripted than I normally like to be, in part because I'm trying to uh, be fair, and be machine readable to, to our large language model friend. Um, so just, if you see me typing on the computer at some point while we're, while we're talking, I'm not intending to be rude to anybody. Um, it's just the nature of the, the pan on me as the, as the sort of machine surrogate. Um, so the first part of the conversation, um, we're really going to be looking at this kind of buzzy and contentious term of the metaverse, um, which has been uh, sort of on top of people's minds since 2021, since it first kind of started reappearing uh, in clubhouse uh, houses and, and sort of ultimately by the fall, uh, Facebook changed their name obviously to meta. We all, all know this at this point. Um, but even going back, um, thinking back to um, Rebecca's uh, keynote, even going back to 1992 with Snow Crash, the metaverse was always tied to gaming and gamification. Um, so kind of, I want to get perspectives from each of you um, as you're thinking about the metaverse becoming a more pervasive aspect of daily life in society. Um, I have sort of different questions that I'm going to be, be throwing to each of you. So um, Dr. McNeil, I'd love to start with you. Um, as someone whose work is directly connected with the public, how are you thinking about access to the metaverse and other emerging technologies? What steps do you think we should be considering to ensure that the metaverse is as inclusive as possible? Are there factors interfering with some folks being able to access them? How might we better use the educational capacities of emerging technologies? That was a lot of questions. I don't do well when I get a lot of questions at one time. <laughs> um, what I will say is um, how libraries are looking at the metaverse, we're using it. Um, but it's also for us um, learning and learning ways in which we can explain it to people who are coming into our libraries, um, especially because it's not necessarily the first thing that people are thinking about, uh, especially in New York City. A lot of people are struggling to pay their rent. A lot of people are struggling to actually feed their families. So they're not thinking about, oh, let me jump into this metaverse and do this thing. However, we also have the flip side where we see it helping people. So a good example is um, we have been doing gaming in a variety of different ways. And when you have a vet who comes in, who was in a particular war, who is now introduced to gaming because of us and now doesn't feel as isolated at home, then we feel like that's a win, right? That's a mental health win for us. And so we're doing um, a lot of things in terms of how do we educate people about it? How do we show them what the uses are of it? But we also need to show them the pros and cons, right? That misinformation 
it's a huge part of being able to explain to people, what is it? How do you stay safe in this environment? And so that's some of what we've been doing in that space. Amazing, thank you. Um, Marina, you've referenced the importance of cyber sovereignty. And by the way, with these questions, answer the parts that, that you want. We'll see how the <laughs> GPT responds. Um, you, uh, you've referenced the importance of cyber sovereignty in the indigenous metaverse. Can you share a bit about those and your work on both? How are you thinking about relationships to and with technologies in ways that avoid digital colonization, preserve indigenous IP, and foster non-Western perspectives, values, and stories? Gosh, that's a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> a series of questions. Um, so first of all, I, I do have an afternoon talk that I'm going to be talking a little bit deeper on cyber sovereignty. But the idea that indigenous nations here in the US and in Canada and in many other countries um, have independent sovereignty um, we're able to assert those rights into cyberspace and necessitate government to government relationships, negotiate cyber treaties, create our own re regulatory environments, um, and look at things from our own people centered and, and healthy perspective as opposed to like a, a corporate and consumer centered perspective, which we have um, here in the US. And so that is really critical for us to develop technologies that you know, reflect our worldview and our perspective. Um, the easiest way that I, I like to talk about, you know, what indigenous culture is, is that we're relational people to each other, to time and space and place. And it's very difficult to synthesize that with a Western worldview. So right now, like, you know, technology looks one way and interacts one way. But as that grows, you know, in adoption and um, development from indigenous peoples, we're going to see very radically different ways to interact with that. Um, and one, one of the things that I always like to reference is, you know, how language shapes the world around us and our perceptions of it. Um, an example of this in, in my Tewa language is um, the way that we talk about our younger siblings. The word is tiu, which means seed. It's the same word as seed. And we have this beautiful relationship with farming and like how we interact with our food ways. And also like understanding that, you know, we have that responsibility to each other to nourish and grow and, you know, help. Um, and that's not there when we speak English or, you know, some of these other languages. So um, when we're crafting that metaverse, when we're interacting with culture, you know, it, there's ways to help bring people who, you know, were not immersed in that worldview into, you know, perceiving the world the way that we do. And then also having access to some some of the, the, the more public... <laughs> There's a, a, something called the cultural iceberg theory, right, where you see the top of the iceberg, but it's like very deep, and um, you know we can we can share some of that without being very explicit, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, we can also use this to power our tribal nations economically, and do so in a way that's remote that keeps our people close. Um, and one of the things that I've been exploring with my venture firm. Um, which everything is very proof of concept right now. And I'm, I'm very lucky to live at a time where I can do that. And one of the things that we're working on is making sure that anything that's cultural intellectual property is not, is, is known that it is a, a cultural ownership, right? It's owned by, by our, our past generations and our future generations. And that's not something that is saleable. It's not something to be taken. Um, and that's really concerning also when we talk about, you know, chat GPT and, you know, the evolutions of AI scraping data, because if we we are protective of that, that cultural ownership. And even if we create guidelines around that, are we making sure that other people are abiding by those guidelines in an ethical way? Absolutely. Um, Rico, yeah. you've been a gamer since you were young. How does that impact your thinking about the metaverse? Being both an academic and a gamer, what perspectives do you think are important now that folks who weren't gamers before are taking an interest in the metaverse? Are there lessons or insights you could share, particularly regarding ethics and first principles, um, you've spoken about not falling into techno determinism, for instance. Why is that important to you? Yo, so like, <laughs> I always start with the tagline that um, gamers have been in the metaverse before the metaverse was a thing. And I think that we live in this time where the metaverse has been like utilized as this gap to bridge between those who didn't game or didn't understand game or who were afraid of it and sell it into a package that is like digestible to the masses. Like we have these talks where we think about the metaverse as this place that it's new. And like we were talking in background, like people have different definitions of like what the metaverse is. Yeah, cause it's a video game and they just don't want to say it. And like, it's wild to me kind of like when kids were in Penguin World, they were in the metaverse. Like when we are in Grand Theft Auto V, we're in the metaverse. Like when I'm 
owning my nightclub and shipping my cocaine business in Grand Theft Auto V, I'm in the metaverse. <laughs> like all these things are happening. There's like actual exchange of finances there and stuff like that as well too. And I think it's a way to bridge the gap, but it's a very nefarious way to kind of like talk about something that's already existed. Because as you said, like people disappear in these like co-opting of these spaces as well too. And then they forget about kind of like what was already there and then they repackage it as if it's something as well new. But in terms of like the ethics and stuff like that, I think it's something that is really like, you know, video gaming was a space for me to find not only safety, but myself, my gender journey, my sexuality journey, and like just like learn about the world. And I think like when you were talking about the library and stuff like that, that's such a powerful thing to have in a modern city. Cause you know, when we went to the library, all we had was like art where like paint 2.0 and that was about it. But to be able to go to the library and then connect with other people in the virtual realm that you know, like maybe we might not have the finances to have a swimming pool in our house or something like that, but hey, I can swim with you in this virtual place. And I think the connective aspect of that, like with our game and stuff like that as well too, connecting children from the Congo or connecting children from Brazil and things like that in World of Us, it's a valley, I always like, it's a decolonial Roblox. Like I literally say that sometimes too, but like think about it, if Roblox was like this decolonial anti-racist, like, you know, like indigenous centered space where people really went into and got understanding like these structural things about the world and cultural heritage and sharing and just learning like this is like actually the benefits of like creating spaces like this in a digital realm versus you know like us doing zoom meetings in 3d with mark zuckerberg and like <laughs> stuff like that as well too. But I mean, like that's at least what I got from gaming in terms of like the metaverse conversation and like what I think also is missing from it, this need to make a common space for everybody to come to, to have access to, to trade and just to restart over from what we have right now. So, yeah, love that. Thea, your work spans a range of different uh, areas under the umbrella of responsible technology from encrypted messaging to the fair data economy to new creator economies. Some people cite the metaverse as an evolution of the web as a kind of shorthand. If there's truth to that, what do you see as priorities we should be considering across policy, enterprise, and investment? Yeah, I'm just building on what we're going to say. It's even where I work, like some people use the word metaverse, some people don't, and I don't even really bother because again, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> you spend a lot of time just like discussing it. So I think the way I would even even taking a step back, no matter if we use that term or not. I would say, you know, working for a philanthropy, what role should philanthropy even play at all in technology as well, like ethically? Um, so the way I look at it is there's rules, power, and ideas, right? And so potentially where should philanthropy engage? So in a sense of rules, thinking about checks and balances, thinking about governance, power, who makes the rules, and then potentially ideas, like who's actually thinking 20 years in advance, 50 years in advance. So when I think about issues around the metaverse, using that term exactly, like where like I'm directly supporting is a lot of like badass gaming attorneys who are focusing on issues around like IP. And again, they're ones, they're ones that potentially would not have been involved in like what the web looks like today. So again, and ideas as well as, um, yeah, people that wouldn't necessarily even have, quite honestly, cash flow to necessarily be at conferences that wouldn't necessarily be at that. So some of it's at the very, very basic level. Um, but again, I think for me, it's more of ethics, like what role should philanthropy even be playing in a lot of these spaces? Um, other than, yeah, making sure the right people are where they need to be versus me being sitting at that table speaking for people. But. Mm. Thank you. Um, if we could get the uh, screen up. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I started prompting and I think uh, I might have to prompt it to be a little bit more uh, brief in its responses. <laughs> um, but um, so I started with the overall framing with the metaverse um, and asked what um, ethical considerations we should consider. And um, what we can do is uh, we can make these available somewhere else. I'll, I'll talk to the Games for Change team so that we're not spending all of our time reading, but I'll just kind of blow through these, these, um, numbered, these numbered sort of pieces. So privacy and data protect protection, accessibility and inclusivity, digital ownership and intellectual property, digital addiction and mental health, online harassment and safety, uh, digital divide and economic inequality, virtual crime and security, algorithmic bias and AI ethics, regulation and governance, 
in an environmental impact. Uh, and so I'll read its conclusion. In conclusion, the metaverse presents exciting possibilities for human interaction and experience, but it also brings forth a host of ethical challenges. By considering these first principles, we can work towards building an inclusive, secure, and responsible metaverse that enhances human life without compromising our values and well-being. How do we think about that? That was mm. nice. Diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I didn't see any gaming or anything like that, and it literally as well, too. And then, like, diversity talks kind of more in, or inclusion or, like, but equality is often conflated with equity as well, yep. too. Mm. So, yeah, they might be talking about, like, equality in there, but sometimes we need to be talking about equity right. as well. Right. So, um, no, nah, you need to do some more work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do some more homework. Yeah, do some more homework, chat, GPT. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to let us sit with all that stuff, um, but not, not do any more <laughs> reading for the moment. Um, I also wanted to have us spend a little bit of time, um, talking about this burst of, uh, activity around generative AI. And just for some context from, from sort of my position, I'm using the term AI. I don't necessarily agree that it's the term we should be using. And I know that there are others that feel that way. Uh, but it's the sort of the term that we have to discuss this topic, so that's that's why we're using it. Um, but we've seen this rise of um, text-to-image uh, diffusion models like Midjourney, um, like DALI, um, and we've also seen the rise of large language models um, like GPT-3 and GPT-4, which power the chat interface, ChatGPT. Um, and it's easy to get whiplash when we're seeing these sort of different kind of takes. It's either going to you know be the uh, this crazy existential risk, or it's going to solve every uh, problem in, in, in healthcare and medicine. Um, but so I wanted to take a moment for us to kind of like cut through a lot of that noise and, and really get to the, the signal. So I guess as a, as a broad open question that we can kind of popcorn, um, when you think about the rise of publicly accessible generative tools, what ethical considerations come to mind? Like... So these generative tools have become available to the public, even though we've been interacting with AI in various ways, whether we knew it or didn't know it. I think that there is regulation that is needed when things go to extreme, like deep fakes and stuff like that as well, in terms of like taking somebody's image through collective stuff off the internet and literally like posing as them in online spaces. Um, and then it's like, but that's me going to the extreme of humanity versus like the unextreme of humanity where literally chat GBT is used to spell check an email sometimes for people who may have like dyslexia like me or something like that. And then it's like, you know, the balance between the extreme and the non-extreme is well. we need to kind of sweet spot when we talk about it. I don't like to do a fear mongering kind of like, not to say this is a fear mongering conversation, but I don't like to start fear mongering conversations with um, generative AI because they did the same thing with video games in the 90s. Mm. And they did the same thing with media in the 90s as well too. Like they're coming for our children, da 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 The Haynes Code Act is nothing but like them fear mongering people against like films and stuff like that. You know, if you're in the bed with a woman, make sure you have one foot on the ground. You know, like these are, things that history has repeated over and over and over again. And for some reason, they always weaponize children in the middle of it. Like, AI is coming for your kids. Like, well, no, not all of them, but you know, like none of them, hopefully as well too. But you know, like, um, that presentation from yesterday. Um, no, but like, I think like, you know, we need to find a balance between regulations, but also allowing people to be in creative spaces like this as well too. But also the fear of like it taking from creative people's jobs as well. Yep. You know, like there's gender AI that people are relying upon to do work or do CGI graphics and stuff like that in the film industry and stuff like that. And that's a very scary thing. I met um, one dude, he used to carve, and this was back when I was living in New York, um, working in Michael's Frame and Art in Chelsea on 23rd, um, literally the hustle. Um, he used to carve cars for companies like out of clay. But eventually he didn't have a job anymore because eventually like stuff like 3D printing and 3D design came in. So how do we not use these tools to obsolesce human beings, but how would you use these tools to like, you know, like help and aid us? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, like there's nothing replacing humans. Like as much as we want to do that workforce leaders, there's nothing that can literally replace us. We're so dynamic in so many ways. And the AI model, as you 
just kind of showed off, it can't be as dynamic as a human being can, if that makes sense. So just that balance between like regulations and freedom, mm -hmm. like that sweet spot is what I look for. Mm -hmm. So I agree. I think, I think I'm caught in the middle of like it being great and it being horrible, right? And so when I think of the services that we offer at the library, right? One of the things is we have a studio where people can come in and express themselves creatively. Um, and we have some people who come in and they are trying to get employment as voiceover actors. Mm -hmm. And when I look at certain AI apps that are now able, such as um, a specific company who's creating uh, books that people can write, it's great for indie authors because you're able to now create books and have it out there, but then they also are embedding this audio model, which once again is great. It means that more people will have access to books that they've never had. On the flip side, that voiceover actor, whose voice is amazing, that they can just replicate what happens to his employment, what happens to the path he's going down. So I think about some of that. I also think about that whole equity lens, and I think that's part of what we are trying to instill and make sure does not happen to a lot of the communities that we see that come into yeah. our library systems because we know we have to explain to people so that that fear mongering that's happening, hold on, calm down, let, let's, let's kind of go through what this all means. Let's give you a little bit of understanding of what it can do, how you can play with it, give you a safe environment to play with it, and then maybe you, you know, expound on that in another way. Yeah. But I think, it doesn't mean that there aren't things happening. When I think of the deep fakes, literally me and my son have a password so that if he ever gets that call and it sounds like mom, who is like, oh my gosh, I need you to sell me X, Y, and Z amount of money, we can know whether or not it is us because we've had it happen. And I think sometimes it's like, it's happening to people. We see a bunch of older adults who come into our libraries who have had all types of scams happen to them because they're just not able to keep up with all the different ways that things are happening to them. Mm. And so, you know, that's why I think I'm caught on both sides because I'm seeing what happens and what comes through. Mm. And so with the libraries, we're really trying to make sure that we can inform people. We're trying to make sure that with the equity lens, people aren't left out to be creators. You don't know what an NFT is, we'll tell you what it is, we'll tell you how you can create it, we'll give you digital art classes that help you to figure out how do you create that thing that you can put on so that you too, if you decide, I mean, you might not be able to afford it anymore, at least not in very much, um, but if you wanted to buy real estate and you're like, you know what, I can't get the house over here anymore because that's unattainable, well, maybe I can get it in the metaverse. Mm. But if you don't know how to do that, that's why we have the library. <laughs> Um, so, so building on this, um, not only is there radical potential to exacerbate inequalities, but um, to reinforce stereotyping and perception bias. Mm. Um, like I've, I've generated, you know, like like Pueblo women doing this, <laughs> and you know, it spits out some just like nonsensical thing, like. The things that we wear are very like culturally informed. They're very specific. They are very meaningful, and you know it's spitting out like random things. And you know if if you're not in a in a culture or a community, you might not know what those things are, and you might not know the difference. Um, but it can create really challenging perception biases and also inappropriate things in that way. Um, but also looking at you know reviewing job applications or college applications or philanthropy, right? Like. Like Native Americans get 0.2% of all philanthropic money, mm -hmm. right? So what is that AI going to do when they get an application from a Native American organization? It's going to automatically exclude because they don't give money to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we run a lot of really big challenges in exacerbating social inequality, um, you know, financial inequality, all, all of these things. But in addition to that, um, there's just a, an incredibly dark potential for the increasing of radicalization. And we've seen that online in the US, in our political systems. We've seen people storm our government buildings. And um, you know that is going to continue to get bigger and deeper. And we collectively need to not only invest in media literacy, but in you know, policy guidelines that are 
you know, healthier for, for yeah. all of us and our young people who are, you know, maybe going into the metaverse just to play and then, you know, meeting somebody who's teaching them, you know, whatever perspective. So, mm -hmm. so can I just add one thing onto that? Yes, I agree. I am mad at the Barbie ass filter mm. that literally oh gosh. would not keep my skin what yeah. I needed my skin to be. So mm. just wanted to plug yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would just say a few things. Um, I mean, and again, I think I'm excited about lots of pieces, but again, it's that tension. I guess on the on the regulatory environment, I think my question is: there's a huge rush to regulate. It's like, well, my question is. Are some of the laws that we already have, let's, are they sufficient? Because mm. some of them aren't. So it's like just adding more, I don't think is necessarily what we should be doing, EU. You know, so like that's, I think that's one piece of it. Um, I think another thing too is again, going back to concentration of power, there's a lot of huge companies that are just growing and growing and growing. Mm. Um, so again, one of the, you know, one of the things we also do, like we're very lucky I work at a foundation that can actually fund strategic litigation. So for example, like Clearview AI, we're actually allowed, we're funding them. We're funding actually a lawsuit against them in California and we're using that um, with the California privacy law, consumer protection. I don't know if they'll win. It's actually, it's again, um, the, the plaintiffs are some uh, Black Lives Matter activists and a couple of other um, grassroots activists, again, linked to the Clearview AI using surveillance and biometrics. Um, I don't know if they'll win, but the point of it is setting that precedent, and it's really to also test those laws. And I think more and more it's going to be specific companies using AI. So again, part of it is also, it's very early days, so I'm excited that we're able to do that. We're also starting to do that um, in the EU, and it's very much linked to issues around, um, um, I think building on what you were saying around um, automatic uh, wage discrimination as well. Because one thing I look at it too is that Things are moving so fast, and there's a lot of focus around like the output, which is the data, and there's not enough focus for lots of reasons, like on the process, which is like algorithm. So again, it's not just strategic uh, litigation, which is not always a solution, but if we can also, how do we stop some of that data being collected and take a step back? I think that also can be very useful. But again, that's very difficult um, to do. Yeah. Right then. Do do any of you? Um... Are there examples like we've we've referenced some of the examples, the Barbie app, Clearview AI, um, where maybe things have uh, gone in unethical or frustrating directions? Are there any examples that come to mind that you're currently seeing or have seen where generative AI has been used in a way that that feels right and feels ethical and feels productive? Like, I can talk to it about in terms of like some of the work that we're doing at Tales in the background, especially like with the Library of Myths. So like I was saying, like it's like 200 myths from like all these localities that we're like shifting through with like different themes, mythologies, deities, like like all these characters and stuff like that. And of course, like people, some like a part of our team, they manually read through all of these in their native tongue and then like translation models as well too. But literally the database that they have put together, it allows us to go in and literally like filter through all these stories. So if I want to find a story that's based out of Congo that deals with like um, making over the world or something like that, or like how the sun was born or something like that, I can literally put it in the filtration system mm. and see it and it brings it to me or other stories that are like that. Maybe I want something about like gender empowerment in this native story. Literally, it will put stories together from all these different localities so you can see the bonds that they actually have in them. And these are like great ways that it's been used, even in my personal work and stuff like that, right? Like literally being an academic, they always like, just read the first line and keep going, just read the first line and keep going. Like, no, like read it though. But literally just going over, reading all my own work and then like kind of like using it to sum up some of the points and other things as well too. But comparing the both, it's like an extension tool. Mm. I think it's great because it's like, you know, we do so much nowadays and it's like a one person journey, like especially like I meet some people who, um, they need to get grants written and stuff like that. And there's like a formula to writing a good grant. Like, you know, like, and if you don't know that formula or if you don't have the money to pay somebody to do that formula for you, why wouldn't I go to chat? I was telling that somebody like, girl, if you don't pull up chat GBT and ask it, you know, like, <laughs> like, 
that's literally a tool to empower you to get the grant money so you can, you know, go publish this graphic novel that you're talking to me about. Because I mean, like, she can't afford to like pay somebody to write her grants for her. And like the knowledge to do that is also he say, she say, or they say, or like, you know, like it's in areas of like nepotism that sometimes people of color or marginalized identities cannot access as well. I wish I had one that could put together a PhD proposal for me mm -hmm. when like back then when I was applying. I was literally just like shopping around, getting it back, like da 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 da. You know, like these very formulaic things, like I think are the ways, they kind of like leverage the divide a lot to me. Like where people didn't have access to pay somebody to do it for them, that admission scandal. Yep. Yeah, like stuff like that, and, you know, like stuff like that. So I mean, like I see the power in things like that for mm -hmm. in generative AI, if that makes sense to the question. Yeah, I would even say within libraries, you know, one of our biggest challenges is that we have people coming from all over um, who speak various different languages. I mean, our ESOL programs alone can have over 51 countries in one class with 30 something languages, right? And so people have to navigate to get into the library, to get the services they need. This then means if you don't have someone at say that service desk that speaks that language that can start to help and guide people to that, how do you help them? And so this is where AI comes in. This is where, how can we use AI for the good in order to help with things like that? How do, you know, one of the biggest things that I think about when I think of some of the ways in which we are not doing things right is that everything is automatically, you're already opted in. Like we need to be able to just opt, we're already, like we need to be able to opt out, <laughs> right? Like, but have that be first. I wanna decide that I wanna do this thing or be in this thing or have you take my information or scrape my information for the use of whatever service. And I think that's not happening and that causes a bunch of issues. But from the greater good, I mean, I think there's, there's tons of ways that AI is truly helping us. Um, you know, we're looking at it for cataloging. Um, so I think, you know, with our collections, there's a lot of different ways that we can use AI in libraries, but really it's for the connection for us. It's mm -hmm. able to do that. Obviously, things like being able to help people who are, so we have tons of people. We have a career services department. We have tons of people who come in who need resume help. Yeah, we literally sure. can't sit with every single person coming in that door if there's a way that there's something that we can use to kind of help them, to guide them, to get them at least to that point. Because right, a lot of people are, you're coming at the last minute, I need that resume right now, I'm about yes. to go to the interview. And we're like, I don't even know you, your background, like, how am I going to help you? Well, this is a way that it can help us, mm. right? But we've got to be cautious. Libraries are very sensitive about privacy, mm. very so that means even when we're thinking about, you know, whose technology or whose platform we're going to use to do some of this type of stuff, what are they doing? Where are they getting the information from, right? Is there copyright infringement? Who's going to be held liable? Because we don't want to be. So, mm. Mm. Um, so f the the examples that I think of very prominently for me is one emphasizing what Rico had said about, um, you know, just making up for the fact that we're consistently under resourced in organizations and, you know, tribal governments. <laughs> like this, this has made, to me, it, it has the potential to make tribal governments, you know, 10 times more effective because they just don't have the, the HR capital, right? Like we're still recovering from the human capital loss of colonization and we, we probably will be forever. <laughs> but, you know, in, in terms of that, like we just don't have enough people to produce the amount of work that we have to do to just exist. So, you know, that's, that's really incredible to have tools like this that help us do that better um, because that helps, you know, our, our cultural survival. It helps us, you know, fight back against cultural genocide and it allows us to preserve our life ways, which, you know, better everybody because we, we do retain some, some of that continuous knowledge. But in addition to that, you know, when we have people who are from very, like, closed cultures and don't always interact outside, you know, it's really difficult to do that code switching. And so this, these tools can, you know, take you know, a general idea and put it in terms that they just might not have access to and might not have had, you know, the personal and professional coaching come into a community. So these are incredible to me in bridging some of those just social divides um, 
Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, one thing just on a personal level, like my mom is blind, and I think I see a lot of opportunities, and she's not particularly tech savvy. So I think, I do think, I hope, that's an easy way as well for her to just be able to speak and do, you know, moving forward with a lot of different pieces where, like, right now it would be too difficult. And then, yeah, so that's, I think, one of the main things mm. that I see mm. like, on a personal level. I was about to say one more thing. Um, if you live in a foreign country, AI is great because you can translate everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always in the store in Germany just looking at the labels like, what the heck, is this butter or <laughs> like something else? I'm like, okay. Or when you get a scary German letter and you don't, and it's just about like signing up for like a cell phone bill. Yeah, that helps too, the translation thing, like you said. So yeah. Um, I had wanted to... Uh, to, to ask our, our pal here, but um, <laughs> the, the interface to access ChatGPT has has sadly uh, died. Um, so <laughs> it's just us. It's just us for the last five minutes. Um, and with that, I just wanted to kind of extend this this last line of conversation, which is, you know, the the title of the panel is Brave New World or Better New World. Yeah. Brave New World. I'm surely surely all of you know, but about 90 years ago, um, uh, this book Brave New World sort of imagined a dystopia where. Um, you know, there was opt-in surveillance and distractions were keeping us from, you know, leading meaningful lives. Um, and so it's, it's kind of eerie some of the ways in which some of the sort of predictions in that book proved, proved prescient. Um, but maybe to like leave us on this kind of note of thinking about the um, examples and ideas that are bringing us toward this better new world, and you know, I know that better can be a fraught term, and new world can be a fraught term, and um, you know. But for the for the for the sake of um, sort of brevity in the discussion, how do you, what do you see as being things that could steer us in the direction of better new world versus brave new world? I mean, the first thing I think about is digital literacy. That's got to be the main thing because I think a lot of people feel like everybody's on the internet, everybody has access and everybody's doing the thing and it's not. Um, you know, we still have people who we have in our classes that we're explaining some of the basics and I think um, it's important that digital literacy play a huge role so that the equity can happen. Um, and I think that is what will help us to get to a better because when everybody can be involved in what happens, then we have a better. Mm. So I've had some really incredible conversations over the course of this conference. And um, I really believe the cultivation of empathy for those of us who are in the business of developing these technologies is the most important thing. Um, I, I met a gentleman who developed a game called Never Alone, which probably many of you know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just absolutely incredible to me how thoughtful and, you know, being driven by indigenous protocols in collaboration that this, this game was created. And, it, you know, it, it was really just even moving to, to know that somebody cared enough to do that. And so for for people in this room who are in that industry or, or watching wh wherever this is distributed, um, you know, it's really important for us to be listening to each other and learning from each other and hearing these different experiences because that can guide generations of people interacting with these technologies um, to learn how to interact with each other and the world around us in a lot better ways. It was the first game we played on our Twitch show. Uh, it's <laughs> amazing, it's amazing. Like, we literally it's reference it all the time story. in our process. <laughs> Um, what can get us to a better world? That's what the question was. Mm -hmm. um, not centering white folk in every conversation that we have um, as a start. <laughs> um, access, leveling the playing field, starting over, not having a seat at a table, but breaking the table apart and starting it, a new table. You know, like literally like all these things of like digital literacy, like empathy, access, like all these things are literally just unlearning so many processes of structural damage that have happened to us over years and years and years. And I do believe it's just a resetting that we really have to do. And how we get to that reset is through like learning these processes and unlearning these processes. Like, you know, like me and us and doing the video game, we were doing this one thing where we were talking about like, yeah, we're gonna put in a, a collection system and stuff like that in the inventory. And some of our junior researchers were like, well, you know, inventories perpetuate capitalism. 
And I was like, well, no, we're not selling nothing to nobody. You know, you're just collecting. Like, but no, Rico, they perpetuate capitalism because you have to collect things for yourself. And so it was an interdisciplinary approach where we all listened to each other. And they was like, well, what if we collect things to progress the world together, yeah. not just the player? Right. And it was like these ingenious things that like, I would have never thought about that because I was in my own world and not like bringing these other perspectives in. And literally just like decentering these dominant ideas and conversations and starting over with something that could be revolutionary, new, impactful, and radical. And I'll just, that's mine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Well, that's a perfect building. I, <laughs> Stop clapping away. <laughs> because I was going to say worker power. I mean, really. And to me, I think one of it is supporting unions is a huge piece and really is supporting, um, I would say, actually youth-led change, but really youth-led change, not 32-year-old youth-led change. <laughs> um, and really youth-led movements. And yeah, and really youth-led building a new economy. Um, I think those are the big piece. And yeah, tech can be a, a part of that. So obviously, a lot of it's going to be on tech platforms, but it has to be worker power to me. Love it. What an incredible conversation. Thank you all so much. And thank you all. Um, Thanks.